April was National Donate Life Month to help raise awareness about organ and tissue donation, encourage Americans to register as donors, and honor those who have saved lives through the gift of life. Later, we'll talk with someone who is waiting for a kidney, and we'll also talk to someone who has received several organs. But first, here to help us understand more about organ donation is Brianna Brown, an in-house co clinical coordinator for the Indiana Donor Network. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit more about the Indiana Donor Network and your role within the organization and what Indiana Donor Network does. Sure, so Indiana Donor Network is an organ procurement organization. We are one of 57 organizations in the country like ours, and we have this unique responsibility of being the the bridge between those waiting for a life-saving transplant and those giving the gift of life through donation. So my role at Indiana Donor Network is I help build hospital programming, um, education to the hospital staff to help build successful donation programs so that their patients co can go on to give the gift of life through donation. Wonderful. So can you give us an idea of how many people are awaiting organ donation right now in Indiana? There's 1,100 people in the state of Indiana waiting for a life-saving transplant. And I, and I would assume that those are different types of organs or tissues that they're awaiting donation for? That is specifically organ donation, so liver, kidneys, heart, those, those kinds of donations is what that is referencing. Um, the majority of them being kidney, those are waiting for a kidney transplant. So, and how many people, do you even have a sense of how many people have been donors in the past in Indiana? I mean, uh, over the years, have there just been thousands of them or? No, it's actually very rare for somebody to go on to be an organ donor. It's, it's a very delicate situation that has to unfold. Um, last year, we had about 296 organ donors in the state of Indiana, which does not even compare to the need. Um, and those organs did not necessarily stay within the state. They could have gone to all over the country. Um, so it's very challenging to meet the need for donation. Well, you mentioned it's a very delicate situation because there are certain things that have to happen for organ donation. And unfortunately, one of those might be that someone is no longer with us. Yes. However, there's also living donation as well. So tell us a little bit about the difference about how someone becomes a living donor. And then remind us again how someone can become a donor if something more unfortunate and untimely happens to them. Sure. So living donation, really the primary criteria to be a living donor is you have to make that decision that you want to give that selfless gift. Um, you have to be of general good health and over the age of 18 and really from there you just work with a transplant center. Um, most of those in Indiana are based in Indianapolis um, but we do have some in Louisville and St. Louis as well um, and they will do a very thorough evaluation on your medical background, any conditions you may have both for your safety as a potential donor and the safety of the recipients. Um, for deceased donation you do have to be an organ donor, it is upon your death. Um, for that to happen, really there is no age or medical rule out for that, um, but you can make that decision yourself so that your family doesn't have to in, in the midst of a tragedy. And you can do that online at donatelifeindiana.org, at the BMV, several ways here in Indiana. So tell us a little bit about what a person who is considering living donation, especially an organ donation, um, some of the things that they might want to think about before they take that step in order to sign up to become a living donor? The recovery process for living donation is relatively easy. Um, I would really just want to encourage them to reach out to a transplant center if they're even thinking about it because the need is so great. Um, kidney donation is the primary one that is impacted through the gift of living donation and that um, patients waiting for a kidney are usually waiting three to five years on a deceased donor where living donation can make that a little quicker for somebody. Um, transplant centers will be able to walk you through everything and there's really no commitment to get that conversation going. So tell us a little bit more about, um, we talk about living donation for organ and we mentioned kidney a lot, mm -hmm. but what are some of the other uh, organs or tissues that someone might be able to donate while they're still living? Still living, you can donate um, part of your liver, can be um, donated while you're still living. Bone marrow, um, blood products, those are some other things that you can donate while you're still living. So tissues as well, you know, we talk uh, about, um, we often talk about how blood donation is critical, yes. especially blood supply is critical, and that's one of the more simple types of donations. Uh, is that correct? Yes, it is very simple. Um, that is outside of Indiana Donor Network. Um, there's a lot of different companies and um, organizations that facilitate that, but it is a very simple process and it makes a huge impact. 
So how is it determined that someone is, is in need of an organ transplant? How, uh, you know, what's the medical kind of process uh, that someone has to go through to be determined to be a, a potential organ donation recipient? And uh, what types of financial implications does that have for the recipient? We've mentioned the donor, but how about on the recipient side? The recipient side of things, it's it's very extensive, their evaluation process, building up to even making it on to the list. Once you're on the list, you're eligible to receive the gift of donation, but that build up to it can take years for some patients. Um, depending on what they need, ultimately their organ is failing and they there's no other option other than to have a transplant. Um, those in need of a kidney typically are on dialysis for many, many years before even getting onto the list to be eligible to receive a gift. They have to take good care of themselves. Um, usually they have to quit smoking, quit drinking, whatever kind of situation they may be. They have to be willing to take care of themselves to even be placed on the list to receive a gift. So what type, again, what types of financial implications might uh, be in play for the recipient themselves? Uh, does it rely on mainly insurance? Are there other types of assistance programs that help someone with the medical costs associated with transplantation, those types of things? There are a lot of expenses related to um, the, um, I'm sorry, the transplantation process. And they have to typically have ongoing medical needs for the rest of their lives to keep that organ from failing in, once they've been um, transplanted. There are, um, insurance does cover typically covers a lot of it, but it's not all inclusive and everybody's situation is a little different. Indiana Donor Network actually has a fund available to recipients. It's called our Angel Fund um, and it helps cover costs um, for families in desperate need for medication assistance, transportation assistance to maintain the follow-up so that they have a successful outcome after their transplant. So going back to the donor side, because we really want people to give the gift of life, right? This is just so vitally important for so many people who are waiting for this. Um, can a family member, if, if someone decides to become a donor, or they sign their, the back of their driver's license or something like that, can a family member overrule this person's decision to become a donor? They cannot. That decision that you make is a decision you are making that upon your death, this is what you want to do. And your family cannot overturn that. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, but mainly that time frame is very emotional time for your family. And you making that decision makes it so that they don't have to while they're processing all these other emotions. So we talked a little bit about the financial implications for the recipient. Mm -hmm. Are there any financial implications for the donors themselves? And if there are, are there other assistance funds that help them with those types of medical expenses that they might incur for donating? Sure. On the deceased donation side of things, there's absolutely no cost related to the donation process. Anything related to organ tissue donation upon your death is covered by Indiana Donor Network. For living donation, um, I believe once the evaluation process starts from there on, those expenses are covered as well. All right. So, you know, the gift of life, <laughs> that's what you're giving to someone yes. else. Uh, and, and sometimes someone, uh, the, the medical community might look at you in a different way because you're becoming a donor. Uh, do you receive any type of, of different medical care when you make that decision to become a, a living donor? A living donor, um, you're, the care does not change. It's your decision. You're going through the evaluation process. You are make, it is your decision every step of the way and you can um, change your mind or take a step back if you feel this is not appropriate fit for you. Um, deceased donation, absolutely not. Your, the healthcare team will do everything they can to save your life because ultimately you have to have a beating heart in order to be an organ donor anyway. So that care does not change even if you've made that decision to be a donor. So what would you say to someone who's considering donation? Um, some of the things that they need to think about. Um, and what would you say to a family who might be worried that their child or that their husband or someone has signed their driver's license? As you mentioned, it's a very delicate time whenever that's taking place. So what would you say to potential donors and to their family members? I would say it is an amazing gift for somebody to be able to give the gift of life. Um, my youngest sister is alive today because somebody sa made that gift and saved her life. And I've had 18 beautiful years with her and she did nothing to, to have that situation fall upon her. And I've worked very delicately with families in this organization as well. And I know what that time frame looks like. And I've seen the hope and healing that donation can bring a grieving family. It's a selfless gift. It is a much needed gift. and. It truly is appreciated beyond anything else 
for the families that are receiving. And you will be supported by Indiana Donor Network throughout the whole process. And for one last thing, you mentioned that you will work with a transplant organization within your communities if you're interested, but also if you're interested in bone marrow donation, which is outside of the Indiana Donor Network, you can also sign up for Be The Match and look yes. for that online as well, correct? Absolutely, yes. All right, thank you, Brianna. Okay. We appreciate all your information, very important. Of course. Now joining us is Heather Cook, who received multiple organs through transplant surgery. Thank you so much for joining us, Heather. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit more about your story and what condition uh, precipitated you needing multiple organs, not just one. Yes, well, I have a family history. At the time, I didn't know, but I found out afterwards I have a genetic disease called familial adenomous polyposis, which is a big mouthful, uh, FAP for short. It caused uh, many polyps in my colon. And before I was even at the age of 30, I had a colonoscopy and found all of this out. But I did lose my mother, my uncle, and my grandfather very early in life, before the age of 50, one actually before the age of 40. And that's why my doctors were keeping a close eye on me and why I ended up um, having you know, the, pr the procedure done because normally you wouldn't have that done until you're much older. Um, with different things, I, I went through many other um, things with, I had most of my colon removed a few years before transplant, and then it caused um, this desmoid tumor to actually wrap around my intestine and it was killing it. And I didn't really know that and there was no way to take it out. And so um, the, my doctors have been in, at IU Hospital referred me to the transplant team there at IU Hospital, which is an amazing team, and they do a number of these transplants. I thought it was kind of sci-fi, never heard of anyone. I've heard of kidney, I've heard of yeah. you know, liver, lungs, um, heart even, but I had never heard of anyone having this transplant done. So I was very scared, um, very apprehensive to even have it done. Went through evaluations and um, decided to be listed, which it is an extensive amount of evaluation to make sure I was healthy enough to withstand the surgery, but also to maintain afterwards to um, be able to keep these organs and, um, and, and be alive. So I then got listed on the, for the transplant and four weeks, it was actually less than four weeks later, I got my call. Um, it's more rare of a transplant as you might imagine, but I ended up, um, getting a call two different times because I was a backup the first time. They want to make sure that those organs go to someone. And the person in front of me needed a pancreas, which I, which, um, I also needed. So two days later, though, I got my final call back up to um, IU Hospital. And that's when I had my transplant the next day. So I had intestine, stomach, pancreas, and uh, it's all from the same donor. It kind of, they explain it comes out together and goes in together, mm -hmm. so, um, which is interesting. And um, also it was about a 16 hour long surgery. And when the doctors came out to talk to my family to tell them how things were going, they let them know about how, what dire need I was really in. Um, the doctor did tell them that my intestine was, um, that, that tumor had wrapped around and it was killing it. And he said I was probably 24 hours away from not waking up and you know being gone. And if those organs hadn't come to me right at that time, I wouldn't be here today. So I am, it's definitely a true gift of life that I was given. Tell, walk us through your, <clears throat> your thought process, your processing of even knowing that you're being put on the transplant list and that you're waiting. And, and honestly, what you're waiting for, because we talk about both living donation and deceased donation, and for something as extensive as yours, uh, you are essentially waiting uh, for a certain circumstance. So walk us through kind of how you processed that. It, it was, that was a big challenge. That was the thing that I had the hardest time with. I didn't get listed right at first because I was very, I, I just couldn't wrap my head around somebody having to be gone for me to be here. And it's just, it, it's an emotional, and it's just, it takes a lot out of you to think that that has to happen for you to be, to, to have those organs. But, um, you know, I had to really come to terms, um, talked with my doctors a lot. Uh, they, you have to talk to a psychologist um, before you go through transplant because it is quite a process. I talked with her quite extensively about my fears and why I was nervous to do that. 
and she talked really through everything with me, as did my family and the doctors, and they said, you know, you are not wishing for someone. You are not wanting someone to go and to pass away and give you those organs. It's going to happen. That's going, you know, they're going, you know, that's something that happens totally separate from what this is. They were just gracious enough. They were just wanting um, to give those organs to keep someone else alive. And so I had to kind of come to terms with all of that. And then I could start, start to think about all of the medical and the process it was going to be because it is not an easy process to after the transplant, but I couldn't really think of that until I got past the other, mm -hmm. um, just knowing that someone had to die for me to be alive. Um, so once that happened, then I started thinking about what my life would be like and, and different things and how different it would be um, and things that I might have to do and just the recovery process. Right. Cause that's a very hard process <laughs> to go through. Um, and there's really, you don't know how to do that until you just are forced with it. Right. I mean, I've had to face it and, and do that. So, but I finally came to terms with everything and then I was listed and I am so grateful that I, that I did decide and, you know, I'm blessed to be here today to support others and to talk and give my story and to tell how important the gift of life is in organ donation. We, we focus so much on the physical part of it. We don't really give enough credence to this is a holistic challenge for someone. It's not just the physical challenge. It's also the, it's also the emotional and the mental process of going through this whole um, whole process, correct? And yeah. And how do you both, you mentioned how you processed it beforehand. How do you process that afterwards? And, and are, are you given support in terms of that as you move on with your life post-transplant? Yes, um, well, definitely have lots of support. I see my, my doctors and my transplant team, they support me all the way through. I talk with them. Um, I, it was very easy for me to immediately want to um, share my story and to talk to people. And I had found out about Indiana Organ, Do or it was, it was a different name, but Indiana Donor Network now, um, actually in September after my transplant in June. And I started, um, that was a way that I got a lot of support. So I um, volunteer with them now and I got my training done in September. And it's really great because I meet others that have been through the process the same as I have. And they have a lot of emotional, um, you know, they, they feel a lot the way I do, but I also get to see the other side. I get to see those that are family members of people that did save others' lives. And they were, you know, those true heroes and organ donors. And I get to bond with them and they become like such special friends. I have a few that we do a lot of speaking engagements together because her, their side is kind of the, the grief and you know what comes of it. And then my side is the joy that comes after it. So that has really, it, that's something that I didn't realize that I would do afterwards, but it's been something that has really helped me all through the process of understanding and having others that have went through it, but others that, um, you know, I, there's not a day that I, that goes by that I don't think about my donor and, and you know, live. I, I, lived, I live for two people now. It's not just for me anymore. So the things I do, I always am, am thinking of that person, too. I know confidentiality is always very important to the Indiana Donor Network and really any transplant program. Were you able to or were you willing to meet your donor family? And, uh, you know, what, what kind of decisions and what... What goes into that process as well on being willing to, on either side, for those, those two parties to meet? Right. I, unfortunately, have not been able to meet. Um, I have not received anything from my donor's family, which I, I completely understand. I think it's such a challenging time for them, and they might not be prepared for that. I still, in hopes that I will someday get to thank them personally and know who that person is, um, because I, I literally don't know anything about my donor. I have thoughts, I have things that I think about. Um, just when little things happen, I think, oh, maybe this, maybe this was because of that. I have just these little things that, it, that I can't hardly explain all the time. But, um, so I'm still really hopeful, but again, you know, their very sad time is my very, you know, they gave me that precious gift, and so I get to continue on. So there is, it's, there is a lot um, that goes into it, so that's why I don't know it is that, um, 
I, I, I do have the hope that one day I will find out. But that's why I have found those people that have, and I kind of feel supported by them, and I feel like we've joined kind of a little team, and they, you know, their family member has passed, and I'm here, and so I get some strength from all of that as well. But confidentiality, I understand that. I, um, and I just pray that one day I will find out who that is so I can actually thank the family um, and show them how much I appreciate them. Well, thank you so much for telling us your story, your walking miracle. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Now joining us is Debbie and Dalton Pfeiffer. Dalton has been waiting for a kidney transplant for a few years. So thank you so much for joining us to tell us your story. Mm -hmm. So Dalton, let's start with you. You are the um, person of the day here. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about what prompted you, uh, what, what was the situation where you determined that you were having some issue with your kidneys? Uh, what year was it we went in? I was going in for a jaw surgery. 2016. 2016. Um, and they, before the surgery, we were doing some labs and uh, come back, my creatinine was high. And that's a telltale sign that there's something not right. And I, they retested and it came back high again. So I went to the ER and that's when it kind of started transpiring that there's something wrong. So. I mean, they thought it was a fluke when they first checked it because mm -hmm. um, Dalton wasn't reporting any symptoms, problems. Mm -hmm. And they were checked it again and it came back high and the anesthesiologist said, we're going to have to cancel the surgery because uh, we could make the kidney function worse mm -hmm. uh, if we move ahead with this. So they said, you need to follow up with your PCP. So they discharge us. We, we called the office. They said, hey, you need to go to the emergency room. Wow. So we went to the emergency room and they, I remember the ER doctor went through a whole list of symptoms for uh, related to kidney problems and he mm -hmm. had none. The only uh, symptom he had was foamy urine, which he never shared that with us. Mm -hmm. And we found out later that that was a sign that you're spilling protein through your kidneys. Really? Yeah. So you've not felt really any different. You hadn't been feeling different, and mm -hmm. and even having been diagnosed, are you? Do you do you kind of look back and say, oh, now I realize that I was having this issue? Or it's yeah. Still, the foamy urine was oh. the biggest sign. But who would know, right. right? Exactly. You don't know until you know. You think maybe it's something I just ate that day. Something mm -hmm. was wrong, you know. But yeah, at eighteen, you would have been about eighteen years old. You wouldn't mm -hmm. have thought anything about it. So after you went to the ER and you were diagnosed with this, what, were the, what was the next progression? Was this um, now we've determined you need to be on dialysis or kind of walk us through what happened after that until you realized that you were actually going to have to be put on a transplant list? Dalton, do you want to answer that? Or uh, would you, you like me to? Yeah, he probably. So he was admitted to the hospital, and they, of course they wanted to give him IV fluids thinking, well, maybe he's just a little dehydrated. Um, that didn't really improve his numbers much, uh, his kidney function numbers. Fortunately, we got connected with a wonderful nephrologist, Dr. Reddy, uh, through that time. Um, they, I don't remember that they did a lot of testing there in the hospital, but he had to come back for a biopsy of the kidneys, mm -hmm. and that was sent off to New York. And I remember the night that Dr. Reddy called us and he told us what the disease was and he said Dalton will eventually need a kidney transplant and we were both just I mean we were in total shock I mean we going from going into the hospital for a jaw surgery and then finding out he has chronic kidney disease exactly. yeah wow and at how old are you 24 24 so any thoughts, uh, did the doctors give any reason that, uh, you know, it, was this genetic or it, what might have brought this on to being so incredibly young? No, uh, they don't know. I mean, it's a big long name for the, the, the disease. It's shortened as focal, FS, GS. sclerosis, it's scarring of the kidney tissue. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you look it up, I mean, there's various reasons for it. it. Could be genetic, but there's no kidney disease on either side of our family. So it's just one of those things. You, you, I don't think they know why. You know, it hit Dalton. 
or Dalton developed this disease. Mm -hmm. So was there any question about whether you go on the transplant list or was it you will go on, uh, you have no other option, you will yeah. go on the transplant yeah. list? Yeah, you will, right. Uh, when his kidney function, you know, I don't know what that those levels have to be to eventually start uh, going for that process, which we did. So this would have been December of 2016. You were hospitalized. Mm -hmm. The testing started. January is when we got the diagnosis. You went on dialysis November of 2019. So we had, or you had about three, close to three years where they prescribed medication. Dalton, I'll let you mm -hmm. talk about that to help slow the progression. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever those levels need to be before they say, hey, you need to start um, start connecting to some transplant centers. I was able to gain to about two years of not having to do dialysis with That's great. with them catching it in time. Mm -hmm. So I, I did have, I did, I was able to have a little bit of time. And how long have you been on the transplant list now? Three, well, about three and a half years now. Yes. Okay. You were officially listed at IU in February of 2019, and you're also listed at Vanderbilt, which that probably will be closer to the end of the summer this year for three years. Okay. Uh -huh. And are you going through dialysis now? Mm -hmm. Is that a daily process? Or it's uh, called peritoneal dialysis. I have a port, and every night I hook myself up to a machine called the Cycler, and basically it exchanges a fluid that's practically like sugar water and that it's basically like the process so if you imagine a, you have a bowl of strawberries and you put sugar on it you can see the water being mm -hmm. pulled out well that's what's going on is the what the sugar is exchanging the the toxins oh. from my body and it's pulling it out so I do it every night while I sleep so it does it allows me to do go about my day and work and mm -hmm. continue life so and you are going about your day and working, right? We yeah. were just talking about your farming. And yep. so how, so being on a transplant list and being in that waiting game, you, you're just moving forward with life. What's it, what's it like um, playing that waiting game right now? I mean, I just continue to work and uh, continue to wait on finding the right kidney, I guess. Mm -hmm. And do they do they let you know where you are on the list, kind of where you're placed, and how how that because you could have a living donor as well, correct? Right. Yes. Right. Um, no, they don't tell you where you are on the list. You don't know. You're just told that it could take years. Mm -hmm. um, and Dalton does have a blood type that's a little more rare. We were told. Um, yes. Yeah, so it could be a, a living donor come forth. Uh, I did try to. Um, they went through all the testing for donation, but they told me that my kidney function wasn't quite where it needed to be. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, you know, uh, allowed to donate. And then his dad, of course, would, but Richard's older and mm -hmm. has chronic conditions that would not allow that either. Yeah. So quickly, I can imagine people watching are like, I want to help. How would they go about um, even determining if they could be a donor? Well, IU Transplant Center, as well as Vanderbilt Transplant Center, have, um, you could just put in um, in the uh, search engine uh, donation, and there will be a section just for people interested in, in donating. They can get more information, and they can also um, enter their information to uh, be contacted if they wanted to pursue that, yeah. Thank you so very much. For well, thank you for us. having us. Uh, best of luck in, in finding that donor that you need. All righty. Thank you. Thanks to all of our guests for sharing their experiences with us. Next week, we'll be talking with Governor Eric Holcomb. Thanks for watching WNIN Newsmakers.